two minutes after, and I know that um, uh, we want to give our, our speaker as much time as possible. There are people who are still joining as well, but I'll start off with the introduction so that we can have as much time for our fantastic speaker. Our speaker today for Department of Medicine Grand Rounds and our third annual Health Equity Day is Dr. J. Marshall Shepard. Um, he is an esteemed scientist um, and the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia and the director of its Atmospheric Science Program. Dr. Shepard was a 2013 president of the American Meteorologic Society and prior to academia, he spent 12 years as a scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He has been recognized with countless prestigious awards and honors that includes being named the SEC Professor of the Year. And in 2021, Dr. Shepard was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is the only member of the University of Georgia faculty to ever um, achieve this trifecta. He has uh, two TEDx talks on climate science that have collectively exceeded over 2 million viewers. And so with that introduction, we are so thrilled to have him share with us about issues related to climate health and justice. And I will turn the microphone and the share over to you, Dr. Shelford. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, can I confirm that you can see my slides? We can, and we can hear great. you just fine. Thank okay, you. great. So I, I want to uh, thank you for this invitation to join you today. I'm going to try to minimize things here. Uh, I, I am actually sitting here at the University of Georgia in our conference center attending the third annual uh, Georgia Climate Conference, of which I am one of the planners for that meeting. And so I'm I'm grateful that uh, the mechanism was in place to allow me to speak with you all today. It's really an important topic and something that I talk quite a bit about. Uh, there you see all of my credentials. Let me kind of move some of those things around. Uh, I am the director of the Atmospheric Sciences Program at the University of Georgia. Atmospheric Sciences is just a collective term for climate, meteorology, air quality, air pollution, those types of topics. Uh, before coming to the University of Georgia in 2006, I was a scientist, as you heard, at NASA. And uh, some people often ask what my title means. What is this Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor? Well, our, our, our athletic program here actually gives uh, several millions of dollars back over to the university for endowed professorships in the same way that you might have the IBM uh, endowed professor of computer science. So it's an endowed professorship. So that's all that means. Uh, I do host a show for the Weather Channel called Weather Geeks. Uh, we do it as a television show originally and now have evolved to a podcast. So if you're really interested in weather topics, I invite you to take a look at that and listen to that podcast. And I am a senior contributor to Forbes magazine as well. And you can find my coordinates on Twitter because I actually am a scientist that likes to engage more broadly than just the ivory tower. So with that, I am going to talk to you today about the extreme weather climate gap, the intersection of risk and vulnerability. Now, this is a really interesting talk in that I am a card carrying physical scientist. Most of my work over the years. Most of my research is focused on things like hurricanes, extreme flooding, and sort of the science of uh, these problems. But in the last 10 years, some of my research has kind of merged together to look at these notions of risk and vulnerability. And I think some of what I've talked about is very relevant to the uh, health sector, med medical sector, and so forth. And so by the end of this talk today, I, I think you'll sort of resonate with why I say that. Uh, I don't know if I have control because I can't seem to advance my slides. So I'm going to stop sharing in here. Uh, let's see, we'll come back in and see if it works this time. Okay, there we go. So I'll, I'll begin by noting that many wicked challenges sit at the intersection of science and society. And as a scientist, as a scholar, that's where most of my interest lies. Uh, you can see this very complex intersection 
Uh, I just had a 16 year old son get his driver's license last Wednesday. And I would be quite concerned if he had to navigate this intersection as a new driver, but it's a wicked challenge. And when we think about wicked challenges, I've got to start here with a definition just to kind of set the stage. Uh, back in 1973, uh, design theorists Riddle and Weber introduced the term wicked problem to draw attention to the complexities and challenges of addressing and planning social policy problems. Now, you may be saying, well, Dr. Shepard, you're an atmospheric scientist. Why are you talking about social policy problems? Well, as we get into this discussion, I think it will be clear how the world that I operate in very much is aligned with challenges that you are facing as healthcare professionals and medical experts. So obviously we all live through COVID-19 and coronavirus and are still living through this pandemic. Um, it's a wicked challenge that we've all faced. Uh, in addition to that wicked challenge, and I, I wanna pause here. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. In the wake of coronavirus, which was one of the grand wicked challenges that we have faced as a society, I began to think about wicked challenges that I face as a scientist. So just a few weeks ago, or maybe a few months ago now, I co-moderated a session with Vice President Kamala Harris. She was visiting to Atlanta. The White House contacted me and asked if I would moderate this session. And in that session, I talked about that the world of climate change, which I deal with, has often been framed as about polar bears or about the year 2080. It's not. It's not about polar bears or the year 2080. It's about us right now. And that was one of the things that I, I talked with the vice president and, and the president when I get a chance to advise on those issues with them. It's a here and now issue. And many of these issues are very much at the intersection of the world that you operate in. Just to show you how these worlds collide, this is actually a graphic from a paper that I co-authored just this past year. What it's showing you is hurricane tracks over the last couple of years that the Southeast faced, so where hurricanes were happening, and places of high social vulnerability and high coronavirus case numbers. And so I've been thinking lately about how we deal with multiple wicked challenges. We were living for several years in an era where communities, particularly vulnerable communities, poorer communities, communities of color were facing the COVID-19 pandemic and then getting slammed with hurricane after hurricane in places like Mississippi and Louisiana and so forth. And so that's what has driven me to think about this. I promise you, this is my only equation of the day and it's a fairly simple one. I, I think about risk. And risk really is a function of the hazard, the hurricane, the heat wave, the flood, who's exposed to that hazard, how vulnerable they are, and then that term resilience, how likely are they to bounce back? I'll give you an example. Most of us are certainly of an age, I would imagine in this room and in this virtual room, that we remember Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Now, when you think about Katrina and you look at what faces were staring back at us on those images and TV at the Superdome, uh, those were faces of vulnerability. Everyone in New Orleans and in the Gulf Coast was exposed to the hurricane, the hazard, but certainly there were people within that community that were more vulnerable and had uh, less capacity to evacuate and go into Memphis or Atlanta or to have the proper insurance or health care to withstand what was certainly coming with that hurricane. And so that's how we define this metric of risk. More recently in 2022, we saw Hurricane Ian. Uh, here's a satellite image of Hurricane Ian about to make landfall uh, in Southwest Florida, uh, affected many communities, but these African-American communities uh, have slowly recovered. They have less adaptive capacity or resilience because of sort of things that we'll talk about going forward. All right, so with that context, and I'm still seeing several people being admitted here. So if you see me pause from time to time, that's flashing up on my screen too, every time someone's coming into the room. So welcome for those of you that are coming. So with that context, let me just set some stages for you. This graphic shows you the 2022 
weather climate disasters in the United States that cost at least $1 billion with a B. And in many cases, they exceeded that by quite a bit. For example, I, I mentioned Hurricane Ian. Hurricane Ian likely was a $175 billion weather disaster. And from our own statistics and data from the National Oceanic uh, and Atmospheric Administration, these disasters are increasing, particularly in the last 20 years or so. The heat wave that happened in the Pacific Northwest of the United States back in 2021 is an example I like to use to just illustrate this here and now aspect of how climate is affecting our weather and how it then may in turn affect medical uh, practice and public health and so forth. In 2021, places like Seattle and Portland, Oregon, and so forth were dealing with a heat wave of epic proportions. They were exceeding 100 degrees in temperature Fahrenheit. Many places don't have air conditioners, and so the infrastructure is not aligned for that type of heat. Well, studies have shown that that heat wave was 150 times more likely because our climate has changed. So yes, we get heat waves. They happen naturally in our climate system, but with the uh, increased specter of climate warming, we're seeing more likelihood of increased intensity in these heat waves. And so that's what we see. We saw this last summer in London, England. London, England, got to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. 85% of homes don't have air conditioning in London, England and, and, and other parts of Europe as well. I think back to a heat wave in 2004 in Europe that killed over 30,000 people. And it was because many of those people were elderly. They lived in apartments or homes without air conditioning. And those nighttime temperatures, when we're seeing this climate warming, don't cool down sufficiently for the body to acclimate. And so that's really where the health challenges come into play from a heat perspective. So let's sort of take a look at that in action. Uh, this is one of the graphics I, I use at NASA. This is showing you the changes in temperature distributions from the mid-1950s up to the present. So I want you to pay attention to this hump, this Gaussian distribution. It's basically showing you how the average temperature has increased in terms of the last several decades. So I'll let this play again, we'll hope 1951. Look at, these were average heat waves in 1951. But what I want you to notice that by the time we get to the present, what used to be considered an extreme heat event is almost a normal event now. That, that's stunning. And what I should also draw out is that an event that's now an extreme heat event is off the chart. And so that's why we're seeing uh, these challenges. And that right now I'm just focusing on heat, but I'll be talking about other aspects of the problem uh, as well as we move forward. The other thing that I'll draw your attention to, because it's very relevant to, from a health perspective, not only are the averages in the extreme high temperatures increasing, the low temperatures are increasing. So notice this shift to the left of even our cooler temperatures. That means that it doesn't cool down as much at night. And that's where the health challenges come in, particularly for vulnerable or elderly communities. Okay, so what, Dr. Shepard? Look, I, I speak about climate change at the White House, but I also speak about it at the Waffle House. And I often get the question, so what? Well, here's an example of so what. This is from the National Climate Assessment, and this is the changes in hours that people would be able to work outside by the end of the century uh, based on OSHA regulations and heat. So what we see, for example, in parts of Georgia is that construction workers, agricultural workers that work outside uh, will have a significant reduction in available hours to work because it'll just be too hot, too humid with, if we think about wet bulb globe temperature and the sort of heat indices that we like to think about really when we talk about what it feels like. So this has impacts on people's bottom lines in their homes, their economic standing and so forth. So I, as a scientist, like to think about the kitchen table issues surrounding these things, not the sort of academic ivory tower issues. So again, Hurricane Ian, um, from my perspective as a, a, a weather geek, if you will, this is a beautiful storm. This is a textbook storm, also a very deadly storm. So we're not also talking about just the impacts on citizens, but you as medical professionals, 
uh, deal with the impacts as well. This is a Florida in Port uh, hospital in Port Charlotte, Florida, after Hurricane Ian. Um, the infrastructure was overwhelmed by all of the water and flooding. And so when you do have people that are feeling or dealing with uh, medical emergencies and so forth, but the medical facility in that region has also succumbed to the storm or the event, what do we do? Uh, this really speaks to the challenges with infrastructure. I'll give you another example. Uh, this is a discussion by a group of uh, medical professionals in California as they dealt with wildfires in Santa Rosa, California in 2017. And you, you see the assistant physician in chief talk about how they were struggling to sort of evacuate and deal with healthcare challenges in the midst of likely a climate change fueled white uh, wildfire. So I now am pivoting to this discussion of vulnerable populations and equity, because I know this is equity day as a part of your discussion. So again, this captures this risk vulnerability exposure framework that I introduce. Uh, this is a paper that me and several of my colleagues published in 2020. And what we were trying to do in that paper was project what counties in the United States are going to be most vulnerable to climate change in the next 10 years or so, by the year 2040. And so I'll show you what we found, but I'll, I'll show you a little bit of the sausage making inside of it a little bit. So we, we projected out future hazards, things like heat waves, drought, floods. We combine that to who's most vulnerable based on race, age, uh, access to health care, and so forth. And from that combination of exposure, sensitivity, and hazard, we produce a vulnerability index. Here's what that vulnerability index looks like. So when you see blue, purple, and orange, these are the counties in the United States that we project to be most vulnerable to climate change based on the actual extreme weather events and the types of people that live in those counties. Now, one thing that might jump out at you, and it certainly would jump out to me if I were looking at this for the first time, you might say, oh, wow, we're in good shape. Most of the country's yellow. There, that means that there's no vulnerability. It's not what that means at all. This is deliberately a right skewed scale. And so we develop the scale in such a way that we highlight the counties that are at most risk. So just because you see yellow, that doesn't mean those counties aren't vulnerable. They are the top tier sort of red flag counties. And so what I want to point out to you are the counties that are most vulnerable are coastal communities, urban spaces. Look at there, can you see the Atlanta County, Metro Atlanta counties popping out or Dallas, Fort Worth counties or uh, Chicago area and so forth urban regions like Atlanta tend to exhibit the most climate vulnerability because of the urban heat, urban flooding, but also because of the types of people uh, from a vulnerability standpoint that are at risk in those communities. And I'll speak a little bit more on that later. So this is me back in 2019 testifying in Congress before the House Science Committee. And one of the things that I told, we sat there and were grilled by the congressmen and, and women for three hours straight, it's okay. I, 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 I actually somewhat enjoy it because I like to, to engage on these topics. And what I told them is the extremes are becoming more extreme and people feel them more than averages. So the next question came, that likely comes in those situations is, well, Dr. Shepard, is the DNA of climate change already in today's weather? And the answer to that is yes. This is a look, for example, at flooding in New York City a couple of years ago as Hurricane Ida moved into Louisiana, it was a devastating storm there, but then traversed the country, moved into the Northeast and caused significant flooding and deaths in New York City because over three inches of rain fell in one hour. I don't know if you were paying attention to the news recently, but in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, um, they got 25 inches of rain in six hours. That's y'all, I've been in this field a long time. That's unheard of rainfall. But it's consistent with the physics of what we would expect because of climate change. Because 
when the atmosphere or the climate warms, it holds more water vapor. And so that's what I'm showing here with this little graphic. So if there's more water vapor available to these storms, they rain with greater intensity. So uh, these are the types of things that we've long known as, as climate scientists or atmospheric scientists, but they're playing out right before our eyes. So I co-authored this report. It's a free download at the National Academies back in 2016. We were commissioned by uh, the National Academies to sort of see what we could say about current weather and its link to climate change. And we found very clearly that there are linkages between uh, climate change and today's weather. And so I won't sort of belabor that uh, point here. I want to get to this part of the discussion because it's, I think, most relevant to you and in, in your profession. This graphic sort of highlights, if you will, the communities in the United States, and frankly, it would apply around the world as, as well, that are most vulnerable to extreme weather climate events. Communities of color, older adults, children, particularly children under five, and, and low income communities, irrespective of race. And so you can see some of the things here that are irrelevant. Uh, some communities of color living in risk prone areas face cumulative exposure to multiple pollutants. Older adults are vulnerable to extreme events that cause power outages or require evacuations. Children have higher risk of heat stroke and illness than adults. I mean, these are things that you all know. Low-income families are at risk of physical and mental illnesses during flood and so forth or crowded shelter conditions. Now, throw in a pandemic on top of that if you're evacuating from a hurricane and you've got a compounded event as well. And so these are just the various ways uh, that people are vulnerable. So I want to introduce you, if you aren't familiar with him, to my friend and colleague, Dr. Robert Bullard. Dr. Bullard, by many of us, are, uh, con is considered the sort of father of what's called the envir environmental justice movement. He says, and I want to read this verbatim, today, zip code is still the most potent predictor of an individual's health and well-being. Individuals who physically live on the wrong side of the tracks are subjected to elevated environmental health threats and more than their fair share of preventable diseases. That's the entire concept of environmental justice. A factory comes in and puts a, a company comes in and puts a factory in a low income community or a community of color or a brownfield or a, a petrochemical facility and so forth. And these marginalized communities get exposed to those events. Well, that's the concept of environmental justice. In recent years, in some of my writings, I've extended this concept of environmental justice to talk about something called the extreme weather climate gap, this extreme vulnerability that certain communities have to weather. So let, let me give an example of that. This is data showing the increase in the heaviest rainfall events across the United States over the last 100 years or so. What we know is that when it rains hard with intensity, it's much harder than it was 50 years ago. The rainstorms of today have far greater intensity. That leads to more flooding. So in some studies we did here at the University of Georgia, Neil Debbage is one of my PhD students that studied under me here at the University of Georgia. Neil Debbage's work, dissertation work, found that African-Americans were 44% more likely to reside in areas at risk of flooding from Charlotte to Atlanta along the I-85 corridor, what we call Charlanta, the Charlanta mega region. So, that's almost 50% more likely if you're an African American to, American to live in an area prone to flooding. Now, when we looked at the Greenville Spartanburg part of that region, uh, those inequities were up to 80%. Eight African Americans were 80% more likely to live in a 500 year flood zone. By the way, a 500 year flood zone, and I want to just use this as a little 101, doesn't mean that that flood happens every five years. That means it has a one in 500 chance of happening in any given year. And what we're seeing is that the 100 year and the 500 year flood probability, we're seeing them more frequently because of this climate change. Let's come closer to home. This is the number of flash flood warnings that have been issued in the Atlanta area and parts of Georgia from January 2000 to September 2021. What you see is the metropolitan Atlanta area 
gets its fair share of flash flood warnings. That's because of the rainstorms, but also because of all of the imperviousness, the surfaces, the, the Best Buy parking lots, the mall parking lots. Uh, th those fundamentally change what happens to the water as it falls from the sky, and so we get more flooding. And so that's why the National Weather Service issues more flood warnings, flash flood warnings here in the metropolitan Atlanta area. Here's another example of what I call the extreme weather climate gap. This is from some work that we're doing here at the University of Georgia right now. Uh, remember, I have defined the weather climate gap as a disproportionate sensitivity to extreme weather and climate events and a delay in the ability to bounce back. Well, my students and I have been using NASA satellite data to diagnose metropolitan Atlanta's urban heat island. Um, you might anecdotally know this or perhaps know it from your profession, but urban spaces or cities are warmer than surrounding rural areas. So for example, right now it's likely downtown Atlanta, it's likely a lot hotter than it is out in uh, Eastern Gwinnett County, the Kula where I live. And that's because of all of the buildings and heat absorbing surfaces, asphalt, and the lack of trees in cities and the waste heat from buses. So look at what we see here. This is the urban heat island of Atlanta and see how those extreme heat conditions are in the, the core regions. But we also took this study a step further. We worked with some urban geographers and we uh, deconstructed census data. And what we found is that many uh, black communities, particularly south of I-20, are living in the hottest part of Atlanta's urban heat island. And we've continued to dig. And what we have found is that many of those re regions where uh, communities of color are living when they, within these heat islands are because of redlining of last century. Uh, as, a, as a refresher on redlining, uh, in the 1930s and early last century, banks, mortgage lenders, and so forth would literally go on maps and draw red lines around parts of cities that they didn't want to uh, finance or issue mortgages to. Many of those were communities of color. Over time, those red line communities became less residential, they became more industrialized, and that's why we see this heat island signature. So this is a classic example of the weather climate gap that I'm talking about. I'm working with engineers at Georgia Tech and Arizona State, North Carolina A&T. We're trying to think about some solutions to this. Uh, we have some very provocative, I would say, engineering strategies that we have proposed to engineer cities for thermal justice. In other words, let's actually take the, this excess heat in these communities of color and marginalized communities, let's redistribute it, repurpose it, or move it out of there. And that, that sounds simple, but it's a quite challenging engineering problem, but it's one that we're thinking about at our universities right now. So when we look at a headline like this, Hurricane Harvey happened in 2017 in Houston, 50 inches of rain in one week, just one of these events that you just wouldn't have seen 30 years ago, likely. Houston Chronicle headlines that a year after Hurricane Harvey, Houston's poorest neighborhoods are slowest to recover. That's a manifestation of the extreme weather climate gap. It's what I've been talking about for the last several minutes. And I wish there was a scholarly, eloquent sort of answer to why it is, but it's actually pretty simple. This is a look at the racial wealth inequality across this country projected out to 2024 and, and starting back in 1983. That gap right there explains the higher sensitivity and the lower resilience or adaptive capacity of those communities that I've just spoken about over the last few minutes. So the reason why your family and my family, if a hurricane is approaching our city, can pack up in our cars and head to Memphis and stay in a hotel for five days, or the reason I can do that and know that I have adequate insurance on my home, even if the hurricane destroys my home, that's because I have higher resiliency and adaptive capacity. I, I fall into a higher category. But look, what most people in these cities at certain communities and certain uh, racial compositions they don't have as much adaptive capacity or resilience. So that makes them more vulnerable to a tornadic storm or to a heat wave or to a flood. So as I start to think about closing, and I hope there will be time for, or for questions, uh, Gilbert Wyatt was a colleague that I've read and studied over the past. And he said something several decades ago that resonates 
strongly today. Uh, the gap between the rich and poor is growing among and within most nations. The global environment shows signs of widespread deterioration. Both natural and social environments are increasingly vulnerable to catastrophic disasters. That's where I will end it and hope hope to take a few questions from you right now. I actually